Hello friends, I'm Rob, this is Digital Wastrel, and it's time to strap on your flaming headgear because in this video we're going to be having a look at everything you need to know before you start a house cordor gang. Hello everybody, welcome to the next in my series of introductions to uh, Necromunda gangs. This time we're going to be having a look at a house cordor. So, I've done a few of these videos, you may have seen uh, some of them before, but if you're new, then welcome. Um, you can check out my other videos in playlists that will be somewhere on the screen. You can find it, you're smart. But otherwise, let's have a look at what we're going to be covering in this particular guide. So, we're going to start with an overview, uh, talk about how Cordor gangs go together, uh, their strengths and weaknesses. And then we're going to look at the weapons and war gear available. Uh, strong choices and narrative choices available to you. So narrative choices are uh, choices that are less mechanically strong, you know, less efficient in terms of credits and bang for your buck. Um, but, you know, still maybe fun to take just for the story. And strong choices are things that will have a uh, strong effect in the game. Uh, balancing those two is the key to having a fun but also not frustrating Necromunda experience, I think. And then we're going to look at some skills. So I'll give you a few ideas about some good skills to take. Then we'll take a, a little bit in-depth look at Cordor's unique skill set, which is the Piety skill set. And then we'll also have a look at Cordor's house mechanic, which is called the Articles of Faith. Moving on, we'll have a look at the roster building advice. So some general tips to think about when you're starting your uh, gang. Um, yeah, just kind of general general advice for that. And then uh, some suggested fighter loadouts for each of your fighter types. And then also a little bit extra, we're going to have a look at some uh, advice for what to do with your gang after your first few games. So you, you know, you play your gang, you get your starting list, maybe you win, maybe you lose, but you have a few credits. And then it's generally, it's a bit overwhelming, I think, for where to go, you know, what to spend your credits on and how to expand your gang. So I'm going to give you a few tips there. And then we'll move on to some hobby tips. So things to know when you're physically building your gang. And then finally, we're going to have a look at uh, four example starting gang rosters. So we're going to do one box WYSIWYG. WYSIWYG meaning what you see is what you get, so everything on the figure rules-wise will be represented on the model. Then we're going to do, um, I'm actually changing this, live changes, uh, one box and the upgrade pack, um, and then an all redemptionist list, and then finally my own personal starting gang. Before we get too deep into things, um, a little disclaimer. House Cordor and the other gangs that I'll be covering from now on are gangs that I'm a little bit less familiar with compared to the ones I've done already. Like, uh, I got big opinions on Vansar and, and um, Goliath, but I haven't got a huge amount of experience with Cordor. Um, so, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But I hope you can enjoy and learn some things anyway. So with that said, let's move on to the overview. So how do you build a Cordor gang? Things you will need. Um, first up, you're going to need the House of Faith book. So all the rules you need are in this book. Uh, they come in. I think they still they still sell them as like EPUBs or um, PDFs or whatever. So you'll need a copy of the House of Faith book. You'll need a Cordor gang box. So you can get by with ten figures at the start, but I would recommend if you have the means to get two because Cordor are a horde gang, so the more dudes you get, the better. Uh, Cordor weapons upgrade pack is also recommended. Um, there's a lot of weapon options on there that are pretty good to use. Um, or if you don't want to get the Cordor weapons upgrade pack, having a bits box and some clippers and glue is useful. Like generally Necromunda is good if you have a willingness to cut things off the model and, you know, bits to stick on or friends to take guns from and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, the other option, if you have none of those, is just adopt a healthy disregard for WYSIWYG. Um, personally, I like WYSIWYG. I like everything that's modelled on the guy to be 
represented on the rules but you don't have to it's just down to your own personal taste so you just build them how you like run them how you like it's your game you know no one controls you you do what you want um cordor redemptionist box is quite useful there are a few options in there like a chain axe and some cool redemptionist dudes that's quite useful um if you don't like it you don't need to buy it i think it's not as essential as some of the other upgrade boxes um, brutes, beasts, and hangers-on can come later, although starting out, if you like bomb rats, you can take them from the start, so, um, yeah, if you like bomb rats, you might want to get some of those. Uh, ridge walkers are super cool, they're the walker guys. Um, are there a lot of ridges in the ash wastes? I have no idea. I imagined the ash wastes to be very flat, but maybe, maybe lots of ridges to walk over. Um, but yeah, these, these models are only for Ash Wastes campaigns, so if you're not playing an Ash Wastes campaign, you don't need to get the Ridge Walkers. Um, in terms of actually putting together a gang, your gang will consist of a single leader. So this is one model that has the Gang Hierarchy X special rule. Um, any number of champions uh, who also have the Gang Hierarchy X special rule. And then any number of Juves or Ganger rank fighters who also have, or who have the Gang Fighter X rule. Um, so the general way that you build gangs is that your number of Gang Fighter X fighters must always equal to or exceed your number of Gang Hierarchy X Gangers. Um, which sounds complicated, but it basically means that gangers and juves have to equal to or outnumber the number of heavies or, or champions or leaders. Um, in a previous iteration of the rules, you were limited to only two champions at gang creation, um, but that's not the case now. So if you're looking online and you're looking at um, advice, you might hear some people saying that, but it's not correct as, as I'm recording this video. However, the chances are you're probably not going to use more than two champions at gang creation but you're welcome to if you want to um so yeah when you're putting together a cordor gang each fighter type comes in two flavors cordor who have the special rule pierce bias pierce um pierce brosnan and redemptionists who have the fanatical rule you basically have the kind of law abiding and outlaw uh flavors and yeah you can mix and match these as much as you like but the majority on your roster will determine if your whole gang is pious law-abiding or fanatical outlaw um yeah the way that law-abiding or outlaw gangs work is gonna depend on which type of campaign you're playing generally speaking this mostly just affects your trading post access and which brutes or hangers on you can hire um, but yeah, if you're playing in like a law and order campaign um, or some of the other weirder campaign types, then obviously they'll have more effects. So I can't tell you this. You're going to have to check with your um, with your friends, the people you're playing with. Uh, but yeah, that's basically all it does. Um, and yeah, you can play a 100% redemptionist gang. So yeah, redemptionists are not their own gang. They are mixed in with Cordor and you can do a mix of the two or you can do all one or all the other. Um, yeah, you, you have a good time with that. So what are the strengths of a Cordor Gang? Cordor Gangs are short range hordes. You want to get close and you want to overwhelm your opponent with numbers and short range templates. Cordor are Kings of the Blaze template. Uh, the Blunder Pole specifically. No fear and love the pole. So the Blunder Pole is the Blunderbuss, Blunderbuss Polearm weapon. Um, I believe it's, it is its official name and yeah, basically it's really good. It's a pole arm, so you can, you've got a bit of versatile close combat ability there and the blunderbuss lets you put down a template with blaze. The ammo roll is something like six up, but who cares? It's relatively cheap. It's really, really nasty. You're going to set a lot of people on fire. Um, I might come back to this later, but I feel like two to three blunder poles are probably the sweet spot you want to take enough to use them but if you spam them it does get a bit obno obnoxious i think two to three blunder poles is probably a good balance between um taking a little bit of a little bit of variety but not taking too much 
Uh, yeah, Cordor are a horde gang. You should always outnumber your opponent. So Cordor gangers and Juves, and this is the pious slash Cordor um, side of things, not the redemptionists. They have a special rule on their gang sheet, on their gang entry, um, fighter entry part, that allows them to exceed the usual scenario numbers limit. So usually you're going to be playing a scenario that says, you know, um, custom selection 10, so 10 fighters can show up, or, you know, random selection 6, so you randomly generate 6 guys to show up on your side. Um, but Cordor Gangers take that initial 10 or 6 or whatever the number is, and then they can take an additional number of Juves and an additional number of Gangers, which is very strong, because even if your guys are not very good, extra activations and extra bodies is usually enough to win you games. You have mostly average stats. You don't really have any w real weak points. So if you're playing Vansar or Goliath, for example, they have really, really weak movement. Like movement four is a real hindrance for both of those gangs. And it's really something you have to play around. Cordor, they have average stats, so they can do a little bit of everything. You don't really need to pay attention to any weak points there. Um, I think you have improved cool and willpower stats on the redemptionist side of things. So this is good for making sure you don't break and resisting psychic powers and a few extra little bonus things. Um, yeah, overall, all of your guys have some pretty nice weapon selection. Um, yeah, the blunder pole and various other things give you lots of template options. You have some very good close combat weapons, like flails and chainswords available to your basic dudes, which is excellent. And then chain axes all over the place, which are also amazing. And then you have a couple of decent long range choices. Obviously, you're not a long range shooting gang, but you do have um, the ability to put out big templates at range. Well, by, I mean, blast templates, um, like the big old crossbow. So that's quite cool. And yeah, finally, the Articles of Faith mechanic is very fun. It's very flavorful and it is very strong, which is kind of the holy grail of Necromunda stuff. Sometimes you find stuff that's strong. Sometimes you find stuff that's fun. But finding stuff that's both is excellent stuff. What are some of the weaknesses of a Cordor gang? So firstly, despite having fairly average stats all around, which is a good point, they also have no particular standout stats. So that means there's always going to be someone who can outrun you, outshoot you, or outfight you. Uh, skill selection is suboptimal, which is maybe a polite way of putting it. Your available skills are not awful, but the skill sets and the fighter stats don't always line up. Your champions are not the best. So I think the champions that you get access to, they're not awful, um, especially compared to stuff like Gene Stealer Cults or Helic Cults, which have really really iffy champions. Um, but yeah, the stats and the skill choices of Cordor champions are fairly poor compared to other gangs champions, especially looking at, you know, Delac or Goliath or Escher have some really, really nasty champions they can put together. Your champions are okay, but you're not going to be able to go toe to toe with those guys. You will need a lot of lads. Yeah, so um, you're a horde gang and that means you need an a, a large number of actual figures to play with. And that means you need money and time to put those together. Um, yeah, Vansar can get through a campaign with a single box if they're careful, but you will definitely have over 10 members pretty easily. Uh, maybe that's a positive for you. Maybe you like playing loads and loads of dudes, but, you know, it's something to keep in mind. Um, you have very limited long range options. If you're going up against a shooty gang on a more open board, you won't have much of an answer to that. Now, obviously, you can go to the trading post and pick up some heavy weapons. But yeah, um, you're not a long range shooting gang. Um, so last one, again, maybe you don't care about that. Maybe this is a positive, but I will mention it. Yeah, there are some suicide bombing and animal explosion themes involved in this, like sacrificing yourself and explosions and strapping bombs to rats. So personally, um, I don't really like those themes used in a in a um, flippant manner. But for me, they are dealt with in an abstract and absurd enough way to be fine. Like, I don't find this to be particularly problematic. But if you're sensitive to those things, you might not want to deal with it. So, I mean, if you got this far in a video, you're probably aware of that already. Um, but, you know, I'm just going to put it out there. Special mechanics that House Cordor uses. First up, we got Articles of Faith. 
So we're going to go through the whole system in a lot more detail later in the video. But just uh, simply put, you generate faith dice throughout the game and then you spend the faith dice to manifest miracles, which give you little in-game bonuses. Um, yeah, you have a really great list of possible miracles. Um, some of them are fun and some of them are incredibly useful. Your, uh, you also have bomb rats, so you can put grenades on a rat and hope it runs off in the right direction. This is very much uh, roll a dice and hope it doesn't go badly for you, which um, is very necromunda. But it can be really strong because the rats can move through um, obstacles and kind of go directly round corners and stuff like that. So hilarious and possibly very strong. And yeah, mixing Cordor and Redemptionists gives you lots of flavour choices. I think most gangs are going to have a little bit of either one. But if you want to go hard on a theme, then you definitely have the option. So that's great. Weapons and war gear. Here are some strong choices that House Cordor can take. First up, stub guns and reclaimed auto pistols. Um, if you've seen any of my previous videos, I will probably talk about stub guns and how much I love them. Um, they're five credits. They do the job. They give you plus two to hit when you're at short range. Absolutely love a good stub gun. Um, reclaimed auto pistols are also five credits. They don't have the extra bonus to hit, only just plus one at close range, I think, but they do have rapid fire. That might be your more your thing. Um, but yeah, you're running a gang that is cheap and numerous, so you're going to need cheap and numerous weapons to equip everybody with. Both of these are good. I prefer the stub gun, but reclaimed auto pistols are also fine. Um, yeah, choose whichever one you like the flavour of best. So, Cordor Polearm slash Blunderbuss, the aforementioned Blunderpole. So this is a cheap blaze template weapon, which is available to most of your gangers. So you have poor ammo rolls on the blaze side, but because it uses different ammo types, Grape Shot has a reliable rule, which means you can actually reload it. Um, so yeah, spamming too many of these may make you a that guy, which you should be careful about, but they are very strong. You and your opponents will have very strong opinions about the blunder pole very shortly into your campaign. Um, exterminators are on the redemptionist side of things. They're basically one-shot hand flamers, and that's amazing for 15 credits. Generally speaking, template weapons are not going to be used more than once. You know, you get you get your template off and you either murder everybody or you get countercharged. So yeah, it being one-shot isn't a huge deal. And yeah, for 15 credits, that's amazing. Uh, the long rifle, this is cheap and reliable while still being good quality uh, attack. This is basically perfect for specialists. Um, yeah, I love a good long rifle. It's the special weapon version of the stub gun. It's not fancy, it's not going to, you know, um, get all the glory, but it's going to really do the job and it's going to do the job cheap, which is great. Grenade launchers and heavy crossbows give you blast template fun. Uh, flails and chainsaws are great cheap close combat weapons because you they give you a bonus to hit. Putting these on basic gangers and charging them in alongside like your fighty leader means that you're going to turn into a real nasty threat in close combat. Uh, chain glaives and great swords are great for something heavier. Um, yeah, great swords are the only like normal double-handed close combat weapon that doesn't give a penalty to hit. So great swords compared to double-handed axes or um, double-handed hammers, you know, those are all bad, but great swords are pretty good. Um, chain axes remain kings of the close combat weapon are, and are easily available to your redemptionists. And then incendiary and blasting charges are also great, especially when put into rat form. All right, unique choices. Um, yeah, bomb rats. So the way bomb rats work is it's a piece of war gear that you can give to some of your guys. Uh, it is a basic action to release a rat. You make an int check to make it go in the right direction. Um, yeah, high meme potential and um, potentially very fun. But it does feel like a waste to put one of these on your leader or your champions. Like... If you're releasing a rat, then you're not shooting a gun, though I guess you can probably do both in the same turn. Um, this might be a really good choice on an overseer leader. 
you know, your overseer leader is generally stripped down and doesn't have as much stuff because they're giving most of their activations to the rest of their gang. And then once they've finished overseering people, having a rat in their pocket to throw grenades onto might be quite nice. Um, later in the campaign, if you get a ganger or a juve some more int, then they're a really good combination. Um, yeah, int doesn't cost much XP to increase, so that might be uh, pretty good. All right, next up, the Gutter Forged Cloak. So I'm a bit unsure about how this works, so if I've got this wrong, let me know in the comments down below. But I believe this combines with other armor, so I think this means it stacks. It gives you like a six up save, but I think putting it on over something else will give you a plus one. Um, I think you're still better off getting mesh from the trading post for your your basic dudes, but this is this is like a nice extra to get on the top of stuff. Um, it gets expensive to give it to everybody, but yeah, it's a nice extra. Um, the scrap shield. So despite the name, it doesn't actually need hands to use. I think it's like a tilting shield that goes on the on the um, pauldron, you know, like space marines have and knights and stuff like that. Um, it only works against reaction attacks, so I don't think it's very good. Um, it's fine if you have the credits, but it's probably not essential. And then the incombustible hauberk, which I cannot pronounce and apparently cannot spell. Yeah, it's actually fairly combustible. I think the incombustible hauberk is awful and you shouldn't take it. Um, so narrative choices. Yeah, um, it's very easy to look at Necromunda tactics and see good choices, bad choices or weak choices, you know inefficient choices, uh, waste of points, waste of credits, all that stuff. But, you know, this is Necromunda. We're not playing 40k. We're not doing competitive stuff. We're playing, we're telling a story, all that, all that jazz. Um, so I've called this section narrative choices. Having said all that, you're not playing to win. You're not doing win at all costs. But if you go into a campaign and you you deck out your gang in all kinds of random crap, and then you go into your games and you lose all your games, it gets really dispiriting. You don't want to lose all your games just as you don't want to like steamroll your opponents. Having that balance is important. So these are narrative choices. The idea is that if you balance the narrative and the strong, you have a bit of everything. You should have a gang that can put up a fight, but also be fun. So having said all of that, um, in Necromunda there are no straight up bad choices. However, having said that, etc, etc, I have this section in all my videos. Um, yes, please subscribe to the Digital Wastrel Cinematic Universe, etc. Um, but yeah, double-handed hammers, double-handed axes and heavy flamers are all bad. I think this is basically unanimous. Um, everyone will agree with you. I'd be interested to see if any of the game designers have any strong opinions about this. But yeah, the reason why they're bad. Uh, double-handed axes and double-handed hammers give you a minus to hit and generally speaking you're rolling few enough dice that having any penalty to hit is is bad. Um, heavy flamers are really expensive and they're unwieldy and they're a flame template which means you can't move and shoot and they're so expensive that you can't really you can't really justify putting a um, Suspenser on that. Yeah, don't take these weapons like unless you really really want to get into the narrative. Don't do it Flamers and hand flamers. I still regard these as too expensive um, Especially considering your access to blunder poles and exterminators in the rest of the gang um, Yeah, it's sad flamers and hand flamers should be kind of a staple in Necromunda, but they're just they're just too pricey for what they do um, So not recommended um, fire pikes are a fancy flamer. They give you minus two AP and rending on top of being a normal flamer, which is great, but again, probably too expensive. Um, considering this a little bit more, like this is a horde gang, so you can get away with having a lot of cheap dudes and then putting a couple of like really expensive, slightly over the top guns on some of your guys. So, you know, if you like the look of the fire pikes, go for it. I think it'll probably do well for you, but be aware that it is quite expensive. Um, so you want to balance that out. The auto gun pole arm and the auto gun flamer combi weapon are probably not worth it. Um, yeah, this is just basically you're paying too much money for something that is probably not really going to do that much for you. Um, you know, they're probably fine, but I wouldn't really, wouldn't really uh, take them. 
Um, yeah, the net last one is a bit, bit of a disappointment, but Eviscerators are an iconic redemptionist weapon, but they just feel disappointing. So Eviscerators are the huge double-handed chainswords. I think if you're if you are aware of House Cordor and you're aware of Redemptionists, one of the first images that comes into your head is a dude with his head on fire and he's got a huge double-handed chainsword. Um, yeah, and that's the Eviscerator and it's just really mediocre stats. Um, it gives you like plus one strength and minus one AP and one damage. It should really demolish everything that it hits, but it's just fairly mediocre. And then there's like a hand flame of gaffer tape to the side of it, which makes it a lot more expensive than it should be. Um, yeah, being hit with a double-handed flaming chainsword should do a lot, but it's just plus on strength, minus on AP. Um, sad eviscerator, do better. Up your game, right? On to the skills. So, as I mentioned in the intro section, um, each fighter type comes in two flamer, flavors, flamers. Two flavors of flamers. Um, probably we'll stop there. Skills. So, as you can see, there is a lot going on with Cordor and skill selection. I've tried to make this uh, readable. I don't know whether I've succeeded. Um, so, yeah, each section um, has the Redemptionist flavor dude and the Cordor flavor dude. Uh, you can see the little key in the bottom here, Pious is Cordor, Fanatical is Redemptionists, and Italics, Italics, what am I American? Italics is uh, the Redemptionists, and then Non-Italics is uh, Cordor. Hopefully that's readable. Um, so yeah, your Word Keeper is your leader, your Cordor flavoured leader, and they get access to Brawn Combat Leadership. Your Redemptor Priest is your Redemptionist leader, and they get access to Combat Leadership and Piety. Cordor Firebrand is your Cordor champion. Funnily enough, they get access to Brawn and Combat, which is, ooh, that's not a good selection really for them. Redemptionist Deacon, who is uh, your Redemptionist champion, get access to Brawn, Combat and Piety. Cordor Brethren, um, specialist type, gets access to Combat and Ferocity, whereas Redemptionist Brethren um, get access to exactly the same thing. And then your two types of juves get access to ferocity skills. So with all of that laid out in a clear and easy to understand manner, let's have a look at them in a bit more detail. So your two leaders, your word keeper and your redemptor priest. Um, first up, shout out to the hurl skill. Um, this is in the brawn tree. Yeah, shout out to that time in the original 90s Necromander when I was a kid, when my Cordor leader um, threw my brother's heavy off a tower. That was amazing. Um, that was, you know, high point of my Necromunda career, if I'm, if I'm honest with you. Um, yeah, this actually serves as a valuable lesson for me to impart to you, the listener. Um, yeah, I don't know whether that was the appropriate skill to take, you know, whether that was the optimal thing, but it created a moment and a narrative that stayed with me since I was a kid. So always take the fun and the narrative choice over winning the game because you're going to remember that a lot more. Um, but in terms of actually winning the game, I don't know, maybe step aside the combat skill is probably the best all round choice. It's a bit of a defensive one. Um, Overseer in the leadership tree. Love it or hate it, it does really good work in Cordor games. You have a lot of nasty guys, you have a lot of guys with, com with uh, template weapons, and you have a lot of numbers. So yeah, Overseer, uh, if you want to play an Overseer gang, it does really well in Cordor. Uh, champions, your Firebrand and your Deacon. So the big problem with Cordor champions is that uh, Cordor Firebrands and Deacons actually have Weapon Skill 4 up and Ballistic Skill 3 up, but they, have, they only have access to Brawn or Combat skills. So yeah, for your firebrands, probably you're going to take step aside and then you just get sad about it. Um, yeah, skills, skills, they're not, it's a, it's a weird design and it doesn't make a lot of sense, but there you go. Um, deacons have basically the same deal, but they can take piety. Um, deacons might enjoy bull charge or devotional frenzy. Deacons can get access to chain swords and chain axes, um, which give you the bonus to hit. So you might be able to build like a close combat deacon if you want to. 
Um, but alternatively, a deacon with scavenger's eye, misspelt. Let's change that. Deacons with scavenger's eye and a grenade launcher might be good as a support option. Um, yeah, scavenger's eye gives you a little bit bonus uh, money at the end of the certain scenarios, which is always nice. Yeah, for everything else, uh, the only notable thing is that specialists and juves will at some point get access to the ferocity skill. Um, skill tree. So yeah, the ever useful nerves of skill, nerves of steel skill can make some potentially quite nasty characters later in the campaign, but you don't go get this starting out. So um, yeah, you know that's something for future to worry about. All right, piety, which is Cordor's unique skill set. I think this is mostly only available to um, redemptionist side of things. Let's go through and have a look at each skill in a bit more detail. First up, the Lord of Rats. It gives you a willpower and a cool buff for nearby Jews, and also it means rats can't come close to you. It's a really fun name and it sounds really cool, but honestly it's kind of boring effects. It's kind of passive, doesn't boost the amount of stuff you can do with rats, I don't know. Um, disappointing. Name is cool though. Scavenger's Eye. So this gives you a bonus to any loot earned in the scenario. Uh, this is less reliable than my best buddy skill fixer, but more money is more good. So yeah, some some scenarios you're not going to be learning earning any loot boxes, so scavenger's eye won't work. But for those that do, when it is appropriate, it'll earn you some more credits, which is always good. Blazing faith. This means you will ignore insanity, and you'll also be able to act normal when you're under the blaze condition. You will still take damage if you have the blaze condition on you, but you can move around as normal, which is pretty, pretty hardcore. Um, but yeah, basically, why are you paying, playing a gang who sets other people on fire while not wanting to be on fire yourself? Your allegiance should be to the fire itself, not, you know, I'm too scared to be on fire. That's just double standards. But, you know, less flippantly, it'll if you're playing against other gangs that use a lot of blaze and insanity like chaos cults or other corridor it'll be good and if not it won't be good that's it unshakable conviction you can make attacks while seriously injured and you can also roll around on the floor real fast yeah it gives you like a special maneuver you can do um where if you're seriously injured you can like move at your full speed towards another corridor to help get up which you know that's a cool flavor but think about how that would work like yeah the flock together involves the fighter doing a spin dash across the floor like sonic the hedgehog and you cannot convince me otherwise all right devotional frenzy this gives you a one turn boost to some stats notably weapon skill i think in exchange for taking some damage yeah this is for when you absolutely need to murder something um there's a lot of similar skills or abilities in cordor like one turn boost in the, in exchange for some damage. So if you're good at timing that strong punch to really knock the enemy down in an, in a key turn, then it's quite good for that. All right, next one's my favorite um, of the tree, probably. Restless faith. It basically means you skip being in recovery in exchange for having a flesh wound at the start of the game. This is good to keep a key fighter in the game, but as your gang grows in numbers, this will get less use. So yeah, basically, um, if you're doing a random selection, you know, you might not actually get picked because it's still random, but it just gives you a chance. But yeah, key fighters being in recovery is um, can really lose you some games, so I think this is pretty, pretty useful. Um, right, Articles of Faith. This is House Cordor's unique mechanic. This is very fun, very flavorful, and very strong. It's one of the good ones. I don't think it's the strongest of the house mechanics, um, but it certainly fits, and it's, you're going to have a good time using it. So the way it works is you generate faith dice at the end of each round. Um, each friendly Cordor fighter has a chance to generate a die. So uh, just a quick sidebar at this point, when I go through this, this is not going to be an exhaustive explanation of how to use this system. I'm just going to gloss over bits that are interesting. Read up the rules for yourself. Um, yeah, this is not 100% how the work rules work. Um, this is just my interpretation of what's fun about it. So with that said, um, yeah, you generate dice at the end of each round for friendly fighters. 
and then in the round uh, following that you can spend faith dice and you spend it on attempts to manifest things called articles of faith which are mini miracles which can potentially affect your fighters or enemy fighters each article of faith has a casting value because it's clearly a wizardry spell using uh, magic and not faith um, which you must equal to or exceed to be able to manifest it um, you choose the number of dice used uh, from amongst the amount of faith dice in your pool. So basically more dice is more likely to manifest it, but it gives you less chances at multiple uh, articles of faith. So yeah, it's kind of a gambling game, um, which is pretty cool. Right, so there are four paths to choose from, um, or spell trees if you like. Um, you choose your path when you're making your gang and it's locked in, um, it's locked to your specific leader. So if you get a new leader because your old leader dies, you can choose a new tree. But other than that, it's, it's locked in. You can't change between games. Uh, each path gives you a list of articles of faith that you have access to. This is your spell list, um, using your magical spells that you have available. And then each path gives you a unique extra way to generate faith dice, which is also pretty neat. Let's look at each path uh, in detail. First up, Path of the Faithful. This is like the generic standard path that all, um, all called all love the most. Uh, yeah, you roll an extra d6 for each unbroken champion or leader when you're generating your faith dice. Um, yeah, this whole section is mostly a little bit dull, but there are a couple of very nice ways to disrupt enemy in it. Um, yeah, each of the Articles of Faith has like a, uh, theme appropriate name, which I'm sure if you love, uh, being a Cordor ganger, you can, you know, wait, raise your hands to the air and pronounce it in a dramatic manner, but I'm going to read it in a very blasé manner, so do with that as you will. And the word fell upon them, and they were broken by it. It's not that blasé. You know, I got into it a bit. Anyway, this manifests on a 5-up, and it means that all enemy fighters within 9 inches and line of sight of the um, manifesto must make a nerve test. So yeah, this is really good, especially for um, low nerve gangs. Like, uh, Vansar especially have problems with nerve, um, or lots of, uh, lots of neotechs if they're causing you problems. Yeah. Five up isn't too difficult to manifest, and yeah, doing a burst nerve test, just having one or two people panic and run away, very potentially nasty. And the heart of that heretic was easily cowed. Manifest on an 8 plus, so this is one enemy fighter within 12 inches and line of sight, must make an int check or lose their ready marker. So between these two um, articles, you're either doing a nerve test or an int test and yeah if a gang is strong in one then they're probably not so strong in the other and yeah making somebody lose a ready marker is pretty nasty so yeah um this is a really good way to disrupt the enemy um the rest of the articles are a bit dull in this tree but you know uh, these are very good all right path of the fanatic um, yeah, this gives you, uh, lets you roll an extra d6 for each friendly fighter either engaged with an enemy, um, when generating faith dice. So yeah, this one again, you know, there's a lot of average to bad ones in this, but you do get some good movement abilities here. And most of this, this, uh, path have got low thresholds, so they're all very easy to get working. And without thought, he smote them down. Six up to manifest. This gives you a free charge double action, uh, but you do take a minus two to hit for the round. Free actions is a super strong ability, um, and you can offset the hit penalty by using this on fighters with weapons like flails um, and other things that give you plus on to hit. Like the amount of extra attacks you'll generate with this, and then if you get the plus one for the weapon, then it might be enough to really push it over. It's not good enough and strong enough to use without thinking, but in the right place, this can really, really help you out. Um, and again, as mentioned before, this isn't the whole power, like read it properly, because if you fail, there's some penalties that you have to take, but we're just skipping over that. And his feet carried him into the flurry. Fray? Flay? Uh, both is appropriate. 
Anyway, this manifests on a two up. So this gives you a free move action in exchange for taking a flesh wound. Flesh wounds are not good to take, but a free move action is very good to take. Um, and yeah, this is very strong, especially with template weapons. And yeah, manifesting on a two up, you can cheeky one dice this without any problems. Really, really good. And it can really, really push you um, into some nasty uh, move, move, shoot type situations. Next path, the path of the damned. Now we're, path of doom, sorry. Now we're getting into the good stuff. Previous paths have been like, oh, there's a couple of good ones, but a few iffy ones. Path of the doomed, almost all of them are great. So you generate faith dice on a four up instead of a five up if your leader is injured or if your gang has bottled. So yeah, you start taking hits, you start uh, losing the game and you get stronger. Yeah, the powers involve getting stronger as your guys go down. And almost all of these powers are good. But the flip side is that most of the great ones have got really high thresholds. So you're going to need to multi-dice it. And the people rose up in their multitudes to aid him. Manifests on an 8+. plus. This means you can bring D3 extra fighters from your gang onto the board edge closest to the manifesting fighter. If failed, one of your guys gets taken captive, which is also hilarious. This is basically great. It's a win-win. Either you get D3 extra reinforcements from your roster, and again, your roster needs to be big enough that you have the space to bring these extra dudes in when you have the chance. And they show up on the board edge closest to the fighter, so if you pick the right guy on the board, then they can show up behind the enemy. Um, and yeah, if you mess up and you roll badly, one of your guys gets ca taken captive, and gangs taking each other captive is always a positive. There's no negative to uh, taking each other captive, it's just great stuff. And a river of blood did drown them. Manifest on an 11+, plus, so you need to super multi-dice this one. But enemy gang must count your casualties as well as their own when making a bottle test. Yeah, it makes them regret cutting you down. These are just the two that I thought were the most fun, but there's a lot of really good and really strong ones on here. So yeah, Path of the Doomed is probably uh, one of the strongest ones in my opinion. Path of the Redeemer. So for this one, you roll an extra d6 for each enemy fighter that has been injured or taken out of action this round when you're generating faith dice. Uh, yeah, this one is the more aggressive uh, redeemery one, uh, and it, me it has a lot of powers to boost your flame and chain weapons. And flame shall burn away their sin, manifests on a three up. Gives your melee weapon blaze. If you fail, you yourself are set on fire. Either way, someone's going to end up on fire, which is basically what all you want. And with the iron teeth, they shall be devoured. Manifests on a 5-up. It lets you re-roll failed wound rolls for chain weapons. Rerolls are super useful and are not so easy to come by in Necromunda. So, as you can see, lots of kind of fun choices. Um, it's difficult not to get into the mood of things and uh, do big old pronunciations when you're reading out the names of these as well. Good stuff. Right, general roster advice when you is starting building your gang. Um, aim for a starting gang of 9 or 10. I definitely wouldn't go under 9. 10 is probably a good number to aim for. You need just enough bodies to make use of your ganger and your juves show up for free type powers. Um, I'd recommend armor for the leader and the champions and then nudity for everyone else. It is tempting to gear everyone up with armor saves, but you're probably better off getting some more armor once you've got some income. Your gangers can live with their faith to the emperor for a few games. Right, so loadout ideas for your word keeper or redemptor priest. Uh, yeah, the, this character's got good weapon skill and average ballistic skill. You're rocking two wounds and two attacks, movement five. Kind of standard leader stats, but nothing extra. There's a few ways to run this character. You can either go fighty and do close combat stuff, or you can go for more of a support character. You're probably going to want a close combat weapon either way. So here are some suggested loadouts that uh, might be fun to use. Overseer, wordkeeper build, um, typo, but I left it in. 
So you can give this character a long rifle, mesh, a cult icon, and then the overseer skill. Um, yeah, hang back and use the overseer skill to slingshot blunderpole guys into the enemy. And then use the cult icon to rush in with all of your mates in a big old flaming group party. So this is strong, but a little bit one-dimensional in playstyle. Um, next up is a stabby wordkeeper build. Chain glaive, a stub gun, mesh, gutter forge, cloak. And then you take the rain of blows skill. So you use the range of the glaive, because it's a versatile weapon, to attack from behind your minions. Minions will keep you alive long enough to start using the Reign of Blows skill in future turns. Mesh and the Cloak should make you relatively tanky as well. Finally, Purge the Heretics Redemptor Priest build. Chain Axe with an Exterminator, Stub Gun as a backup, Mesh, Restless Faith to keep in the fight, and then you run up and you hit things and you also set them on fire. If you want the credits, try taking a second Chain Axe to really tear things up. Alright, Champions, Firebrand and Deacon loadout ideas. Both of them have got Weapon Skill 4 up and Ballistic Skill 3 up, but only really close combat skills. Cordor Firebrand is mostly just shit there to shoot the big crossbow. The Deacon can offset his average Weapon Skill with a Chain Axe. Alright, some uh, build suggestions. I'm not crossbow, I'm just disappointed bow. Firebrand build. So you get a heavy crossbow, maybe a stub gun, flak armor if you're feeling fancy, step aside, that's it, point and shoot, it's just a dude carrying a crossbow. Fire support deacon, deacon build, grenade launcher mesh, scavenger's eye, scavenger's eye is a great passive skill to combo with the launcher, if you have the credits consider a chain axe for a backup weapon if anybody gets too close. Brethren Ganger loadout ideas. Blunderpole on the Cordor Gangers, sprinkle in a few auto guns for ranged. Long rifle is great for your specialist. And for the Redemptor side of things, auto guns with exterminators are good. Uh, chain axes can make standard gangers quite scary in close combat too. And for your juves, bone pickers, uh, flails and or stub guns for your bone pickers. A single stub gun to keep him cheap isn't a bad idea. Give him a flail and give him like uh, some grenades if you're fa feeling fancy. I would recommend taking two to three um, to make use of their special rule in your roster uh, minimum. Uh, zealots on the other hand are not very good and, and you can skip them really. If you are going to take a zealot, either keep them cheap with a stub gun slash knife or go all in on the ridiculousness and just give them an eviscerator and just see what happens. But yeah, you really don't need to have uh, zealots at all. The only real reason to take them is probably if you if you want to go fully on the uh, Redemptor thing, or maybe you get some free ones from uh, from your campaign or something like that. But I don't recommend zealots; they're not very good. Uh, brutes, beasts, and hangers on. So the Stig Shambler is not very good. So only take it if you like the miniature or like the narrative of it. Um, yeah, a bit disappointing compared to other gangs, brutes, but. You know, if you like it, it's fine, but if you don't like it, you don't need it, it's not so great. Ambots are cheaper for Cordor and remain amazing. I love an Ambot, Ambots are great, models are good, uh, rules are good, good times with Ambots. So yeah, Cordor get them for cheaper because they dig through the trash and apparently some people just throw out their Ambots when they stop working. Cordor fix them up, get them for cheaper, good stuff. Ogryn are also available, Ogryn a bit disappointing, um, yeah. But you can get one if you want. Sheen Bird is available to your pious characters. So that's your uh, generic, not generic, your basic Cordor dudes. Um, it's fun, but nothing super special. It kind of has this attack where it runs out and it pecks people and then runs back to you, which is kind of fun, but, you know, it's fine. Uh, the Cherub Servitor, on the other hand, is available to fanatic characters and it's really good. It can tank shots for the owner and it has basically a 4-up invulnerable save. It's not quite as overpowered as the uh, familiar for um, cultist gangs, but it's very, very good and you should definitely consider taking one if you have any redemptionists in your team. Hive Preacher is uh, one of the hangers-on. It's one of the unique hangers-on. He's got a nice mechanic to boost your faith dice. 
generation. Um, and he does show up to regular games. He doesn't just hang out off camera. Um, but he is a bit pricey at 70 credits. Yeah, if you find your faith dice um, generation lacking in games, and he's not a bad choice. But yeah, 70 credits is quite a lot. And the flagellator uh, can whip someone out of recovery at the cost of a flesh wound. So this is quite similar to that restless faith skill, which is pretty nice. It's still a gamble if they'll show up or not, but he only costs 30 credits, so he's not too bad. Um, but yeah, the the corridor hangers on are not super exciting to me. Um, get a rogue talk. Rogue docks are good. What do you aim for after your first few games? So yeah, this is a section that I've included um, because when I was starting out the game and I was reading up on lots of other people's um, advice and watching lots of, you know, um, tactics videos and that kind of thing, it's really difficult to get people uh, get advice about this kind of thing because you start the game, you start a campaign, you play one or two games, you get some credits coming in and then you're looking at your options, you're like, where do I go from here? What? How do I expand the gang? Um, yeah, it's really, there's too much choice and it's it's a bit overwhelming for new people. So here is my advice about what to do uh, in that situation. First up, get more bodies. I would try and expand until you have like a, maybe 12 to 14 strong gang. Um, you're going to have high fighter turnover because you're going to be throwing in your chaff into the meat grinder. So you're going to need fresh meat. Give yourself enough bodies to survive a bad game and still be able to go into the next one with a strong roster. Um, more elite gangs like your Goliaths and your Vansar, if they have a bad gang, a bad game, and they go into the next one with really depleted and then they lose that one, they can go into a death spiral. But because you got the numbers, you can kind of um, bully your way through that kind of situation. So that's that's a definite strength that you want to play into. Yeah, next up, get some clothes. Uh, start buying everybody some armor. You don't need it at the start, but once people start uh, getting XP and stuff, you can get them some armor. Book of Redemption and the Refractor Field for your leader. This is Redemptor Priest, uh, Redemption side only. Both of these are good items, but they're a bit expensive to start with. Book of Redemption is like a AoE or a, a buff for your dudes, and Refractor Field is a Force Field um, save. Yeah, both of them are good, but a um, little bit too pricey for starting out, in my opinion. But if you don't start with them, it's worth picking up. Yeah, next up, get some rats. So you can, of course, start with them. I haven't really talked about rats that much. Um, I think tactically they're not the best choice. Obviously, they're really appealing to a lot of people. So if you want to go heavy rats at the start, you can. But um, if you don't, if you start getting a ganger that's got an int upgrade, then yeah, he's a great candidate for rat keeping um, as the games go on. After that, you're probably at a stage where you can afford to start spending money on luxuries like ambots, hangers on, heavy weapons from the trading post, stuff like that. But yeah, this is not a completely exhaustive list. Some options I've missed. Um, Rogue Dock is always a good investment, whatever your gang. But yeah, have fun. Um, if you don't like any of this and you want to go straight to buying an ambot or straight to buying a missile launcher, do it, you know, um, have a good time. Stuff to know about building a corridor gang. As you might have noticed from me using artwork and images from the book instead of my own kit, I do not have a painted corridor gang. Shocking, sadly. Um, but yeah, so these are my general hobby ideas though. Uh, yeah, lots of people kit bash Cordor with Adeptus Mechanicus parts. Gives it that real junkyard look. They go together really well. It's a good, it's a good aesthetic. Uh, so consider add mech parts for your Cordor. Uh, the Fantasy Flagellant kit is also a good source of crazy preacher vibe bits. Uh, you have a plenty of varieties of Chaos Cultist or indeed Gene Stealer Cultist miniatures out there. Feel free to trim off the Chaos Stars or uh, Gene Stealer symbols and turn them back to the Emperor. So yeah, the House Cordor comes from all over the world, like the, the trash of the of civilization united in faith, etc. So yeah, look to whatever range you want and build a gang out of it. Um, you have a lot of options in terms of miniatures, so go wild. Finally, we are on to everybody's favourite part of the video. It's the example starting gangs. Oh yeah. 
This is a one box WYSIWYG gang. WYSIWYG means what you see is what you get. So everything on this roster can be built from one box. The sprues in the box. Um, I'm pretty sure that you can build this without trimming any parts off or having to do any conversions. So this is a nice one if you're just starting out. Um, yeah, here we go. Word Keeper. And we're going to give the Word Keeper a stub gun, a pole arm, and a mesh armor. So yeah, the model has got that weird kind of icon shield uh, axe thing. For this particular gang list, I'm going to count that weapon thing as a pole arm. Um, and yeah, we're just going to go with basically a fairly simple and cheap uh, loadout. We're going to go with the Overseer Power uh, skill. Then we got two firebrands. Each one has got a stub gun, heavy crossbow, flak armor, and the step aside skill. So uh, spamming and repeating units is generally not super great to do in Necromunda, but the corridor box doesn't have a huge amount of interesting weapons and interesting heavy or special weapons in it. So with that in mind, I just took the heavy crossbow twice. Um, and using Overseer, you can use it to kind of get lots of crossbow shots off. So that's the strategy there. Then we got three bone pickers. Each of them has got a stub gun. One of them has got some blasting charges. And then we got two brethren with blunder poles. Brethren with a reclaimed auto gun. And a brethren specialist with a reclaimed auto gun. So Brethren Specialists can take um, special weapons, but there's none on the sprue, so uh, he's just got a basic auto gun. But as the campaign goes on, you can always buy him a special weapon um, in the future. Even if you don't have any special weapons when you're starting out, always take your free specialist, because you can always equip them with something fancier uh, later on. This comes to a thousand credits total. Um, Next up, one box and an upgrade pack, WYSIWYG gang. So yeah, this is one basic box of Cordor and then the little plastic weapons kit that uh, GW sells. So for this gang, we've got a word keeper with a stub gun, a chain glaive, mesh armor, gutterforged cloak, and the rain of blows skill. So this leader is going to be a lot more getting stuck in and doing some fighting. And then we've got a firebrand with a stub gun, heavy crossbow, flak armor, step aside skill. Another firebrand with a stub gun, long rifle, flak armor, and the step aside skill. Um, we got three bone bone pickers, each of them with stub guns. One with a fighting knife, one with a reclaimed auto pistol, one with a flail. Just a little bit of variety there. Um, yeah, stub gun and an auto pistol combo. You know, is it good? Who knows? Does it look cool? Absolutely. If you can always have uh, one guy on your gang with two pistols that's a necromunda top tip from me um yeah another thing to keep in mind also when we're talking about WYSIWYG uh the kind of generally accepted WYSIWYG is that you don't have to represent basic pistols like the stub gun and grenades so for example the firebrand with the heavy crossbow and the stub gun you don't need to model the stub gun on it assume that he's got it stuck down his pants or in his jacket or something like that um stuck down his pants american pants or british pants you decide anyway back to the list we got two brethren with blunder poles and then we got a brethren with a flail and a reclaimed auto gun and then a brethren specialist with a stub gun and a long rifle so just the one heavy crossbow here but we got two long rifles and we've got a lot more fighty dudes we got some flail um bone pickers and some flare brethren so they're going to move up with the word keeper get some fights going on and then you've got the long rifles to support them from a distance um yeah i quite like this list i think i think it's not too bad for a starting one and this is also 1000 credits total next up all redemptionist gang so i'm pretty sure you can build this from buying two redemptionist boxes the redemptionist box only comes with six bodies so you're probably going to need two of them if you're going full redemptionists um, assuming you're using the GW Redemptionist box, of course. Anyway, we got a Redemptor Priest, who's got Stub Gun, Chain Axe with Exterminator, Mesh Armor, and the Reign of Blows skill. So yeah, Chain Axes are great. Redemptor Priest is going to do okay in combat. Um, Exterminator for the uh, close range template. Excitement. We got a Deacon with Grenade Launcher, Mesh Armor, Scavenger's Eye. Another Deacon 
with an eviscerator, mesh armor, and restless faith. So earlier in the video, I was talking about deacons not being super good in close combat and eviscerators being disappointing. But you know what? We're playing a redemptionist list. All redemptionists, it would be frankly illegal to not have an eviscerator. So let's just lean into it. You know, the dice are not in your favor, but you just have to pray to the emperor for good rolls and we'll see what happens. And if he does get murdered every game, he's got restless faith, so he keeps coming back. Then we've got two brethren with auto guns and exterminators. 80 credits isn't too bad for a basic dude, and the exterminator, if they get up close, you know, one shot hand flamer, pretty nice. We got a brethren with two stub guns, we got another brethren with a stub gun and a chain axe, and another brethren with a ch stub gun chain axe, and then a brethren specialist with just a chain axe, um, mostly just for the for the cost. Um, yeah, as things go on, you can buy the specialist uh, grenade launcher or something like that. But we got loads of chain axes for close combat murdering. We got the um, eviscerator to see what that does. We got a grenade launcher for a little bit of long range um, support. And then with the two exterminators and um, or the three exterminators throughout the thing, we've got plenty of templates as well. So yeah, um, this should play like a redemptionist gang plays. Lots of close combat, lots of chain weapons, and lots of fire. Good stuff. Finally, my own personal starting gang. This is not secret tech. This is not super high level tactics that I'm keeping from all of you. This is just if I was starting a Cordor gang, a um, new campaign, this is probably what I would build because it's just stuff that I think seems fun. So I've gone with a word keeper. Uh, with the hand flamer and a great sword, uh, mesh armor, rain of blows. I think the great sword is pretty cool. I think having a big old sword in um, a sci fi setting is also pretty hardcore. Um, yeah, it's a good aesthetic, so I think that's a good match uh, for a leader. We've got a firebrand with a heavy crossbow, flak armor step aside, because again, you know, heavy crossbow is cool as hell. We've got a deacon with grenade launcher, chain axe, mesh armor, scavenger's eye. A bit of all round, you know, you can drop grenades on people and then chain axe them if they get too close. We got three bone pickers, each of them has got a stub gun. One's got two stub guns, because again, always have uh, someone in your team with two pistols, that's mandatory. One of them's got a flail, so he can help out in close combat. Not very good, but you know, uh, he's still cheap, you can throw him in there. We got two blunder pole brethren, and we've got a long rifle specialist brethren. And that comes to a thousand points total. Is this a good list? Um, honestly, I have no idea. I've played against Cordor plenty of times. Um, I've got some ideas for actually putting together a Cordor gang. I might do that as like a series if you're interested. If that sounds cool to you, let me know down below. I might do like a, a vlog type series about how to build a gang from zero, like assembling it and painting it and all that kind of thing. Might be quite fun to do. Um, but other than that, that's the end. It's the end of the video. Thanks for watching to the end. Um, I've decided to kind of try and knuckle down and push through the last few guides for this. We got a few more to do. Um, I know people are looking forward to the um, the enforcers and the uh, corpse grinder cults, obviously. And then we've got who who else we got left? We got the uh, slave ogren. That's going to be an interesting one. And then probably the uh, the Ash Waste Raiders, and then my goal is to get one of these done for each of them, and then I can make a nice playlist and, you know, uh, be a nice resource for people that come to the channel. We're closing in on 1,000 subscribers, so if you are one of those subscribers, thank you very much, and if not, why not? You know, press the button. That's, that's all I ask. One little press. Um, yeah, that's the end of the video. Thanks very much. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Bye. Nailed it. Ah. Uh...